this is actually a testament to how amazing this is. You know, you guys don't have to be sitting in front of a computer. You can walk around, you can go for a jog, you, can, you know, hang out and, and still be involved and connected to this. So it's, it's awesome. Uh, Dr. Langer's coming on next. I'm not sure. Has he been pulled in yet? Yep. I'm here. Hey, Dr. Langer. So yeah, this is the first of the uh, chairman's corner. And I don't know what he has in store for you guys, but I'm sure it's going to be special and fantastic. And uh, I probably won't sign in at the end of this one. I wanted to let you guys know that um, a little bit of a change by the book, which is uh, John Bookfar's uh, webinar series, is moving from Fridays to Thursdays. It'll be next Thursday. They're taking off for the holiday weekend. So please enjoy your July 4th. Stay safe, everyone. Wear a mask when you go outside, as you can see. And, uh, and with that, I'll let Dr. Langer take it away. Have fun. JB, oh, there's, there say, he is. <laughs> JB, you want to say something about your dog? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my new Lhasa Poo Bailey. Bailey, say hi to everybody across the globe. Bailey, good girl. Good girl. Anyway, have a great holiday uh, weekend, USA, and to the rest of the globe. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, David, I'll watch the first uh, 19 seconds of the Chairman's Corner, and then I'm going to start my weekend. So, did you tell him about you by the book? Did you tell him about by the book. By the book is July 9th. We restart with a great lineup. My by the book is my twin brother, myself, and my first cousin Peter, who's a CNBC correspondent. We talk about your life, your health, your money, and so we'll see you on Thursday. That's it. Hey. All right, guys, take care. Take it away, hey, David. Come on, Bailey. Come on. So um, I've given this talk a few times to a number of different audiences. I might, I'm going to use this, this for these Fridays just to uh, try to not necessarily talk about neurosurgery, but uh, to give you all a little perspective on uh, maybe some just lessons that our teams learned uh, over our, our, our careers and uh, just larger issues and metaphoric things to, to basically encourage you and inspire you. And uh, I think that's the goal of this talk today. What I'm going to do is talk about um, a little bit about COVID. I'm sure it's, have you ever heard of that? If anybody's not heard of that, let me know. Um, and also how we responded uh, to it as a neurosurgeon um, and as a department. And then, uh, uh, give you some thoughts about likely what's going to happen. I'll teach you a little about the science of COVID, um, a little bit about the medicine and the treatment, um, and we'll go from there. This was the uh, cover of New York Magazine um, in early March. Uh, living in New York City during this was uh, quite an experience for all of us. So uh, COVID, the coronavirus is a, uh, originally, we, at least we think, as we're being told, comes from Wuhan, China. Um, that's where the original infections occurred from a, a, whole, whole, a wholesale seafood market. Uh, there's a, it's basically a live animal market in, in uh, Wuhan. It, ha it also is, I'm not sure if you've paid attention, it's near a virology lab and it's, there's been a lot of confusion as to exactly where and was it human engineered or not. And, but it's really irrelevant at this point. And well, I mean, you may never know the, the truth, um, but what we do know about the virus from a scientific perspective is that it's, very distinct from these other respiratory viruses that you may have heard of, SARS and MERS. And it has a very uh, significant genetic similarity to a bat coronavirus uh, that's a well-known coronavirus. What's interesting about bats, we don't see them very often, but they're there. They obviously they come out at night. Bats are like an enormous reservoir of viruses. There are literally thousands of, of viruses and animals. And one of the reasons why we'll never eradicate viruses is because the vast majority never uh, transfer to humans. Bats turn out to be an incredibly robust reservoir of, vi of viruses. And because they, they, a lot of them uh, around animals and, and the domesticated animals in particular, um, they're gonna be, it's gonna be here to stay. They, they actually you know, bite uh, cows and horses uh, to drink their blood. And that's a great way of transferring these things all throughout the animal world. Um, so we're, we're never going to get rid of them. They're going to continue to come back over the years. And that's why I think this is really the first time, actually in our lifetime, we're dealing with something like this and hopefully the last, but I think we'll be a lot more prepared the next time. Uh, the the, the um, coronavirus is a beta coronavirus. The alpha and beta infect humans. The uh, gamma and delta don't. 
So there are really four different types of coronaviruses. And I, I just picked up this slide. You know, we didn't get the virus from eating a bat, but nonetheless, uh, one person can change the world. Uh, you know, all it took is one human getting infected, and it's uh, obviously had this enormous impact on all, essentially the entire world. I think ultimately it's going to have an even bigger impact in some third world countries. And I know we have a very international audience, and uh, depending on your medical uh, capabilities and your medical resourcing, this could be this could be a devastating thing uh, in the in the world, really. And we're we're obviously hoping for a vaccine. And I'll get into some of the vaccine technology at the end. <clears throat> so, how does this actually work? Well, there's a what's interesting about the virus, and the reason why I'm showing this slide is it also uh, there's basically if you in medical school you're going to have um, you're going to have physiology, and then you're going to have pathophysiology. Physiology is the normal way organs work, and then pathophysiology is the disease of organs. Well, this is how a virus gets in and replicates, but it's also, from a pathophysiological perspective, provides targets for, for intervention. And each step in this is a potential source of intervention. One of the most common ways that we're right now attacking the virus, in the very step one, that these, these proteins on the surface of the virus, these, these, uh, these S proteins is what they're called, they're spikes on the top of, on, on, that's where it gets the corona name, binds the ACE2 receptor, which, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme, that's what ACE stands for. And it's on the surface of many different cells in the body, particularly in the lung. It binds this, it doesn't activate the receptor like angiotensin does, which is the actual protein that normally binds this. This is just a random interaction that, that the virus just happens to have a protein structure that binds this, this receptor. It wasn't meant to be, it's just, just dumb luck. Once it binds the receptor, it, it basically internalizes with the receptor. It sort of unfolds itself and releases its RNA. The, the coronavirus is a pure single strand RNA virus and there's no DNA in it at all. The RNA is then released into the, into the cell uh, the, the RNA is then translated into protein, and then those proteins reassemble into a new virus, including the RNA itself. So the RNA replicates and also generates uh, viral proteins, and then it gets excreted from the cell. It basically takes over the cell. <clears throat> so the, 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 the areas of intervention are attacking the surface proteins to prevent binding, blocking the ACE2 receptor, preventing RNA, prol RNA proliferation, blocking viral protein formation, and preventing uh, uh, the, the virus from regenerating and getting excreted from the cell. And all those different points of, of, uh, of uh, production are potential sources that can be targets of, of uh, therapy. This is sort of a, a, a modified view of, of what a virus, what this virus looks like based on electron microscopy. What you're seeing here are these S1 surface proteins, this capsid of the virus, and then inside is a single strands of RNA all wrapped together. The uh, incub incubation period of Corona-19 is about five days. So uh, it takes about five days for the virus to infect you and then to become symptomatic. The difficult thing about this virus in particular is that there's a number of people, and particularly young people, that can be infected but are asymptomatic, meaning they have no clinical symptoms. It's, it's a major problem because people can be carriers, people can infect others having no cough, no fever, and that's why wearing a mask is so important because even if you feel fine, wearing a mask prevents you from, it has a, one other barrier for you to deliver that virus to someone who might be susceptible to getting infected. It's a single-stranded RNA. It's a relatively long RNA segment. Coronavirus is the seventh known coronavirus to infect humans. The others, you know, SARS, which is uh, a respiratory virus, and MERS were epidemic in, in China, Hong Kong, and Thailand, and these, these have been out before. <clears throat> the classic symptoms and signs of coronavirus are there's a classic chest x-ray appearance, cough, fever, elevated white count. That's the sort of some of the signs and symptoms of coronavirus. And as I said, it, in, it enters the cell, the cells in the body by binding this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. That's the target in the body. Uh, I spent some time at a Javits Center uh, working in the ICUs there. And this, this picture I took 
when I was there, uh, just to, I thought it really, the nice thing about this, it really shows on the left side, which is the right side of the screen, shows a, a more normal appearing lung, at least in the apex of the lung, the top of the lung. And then the right side over on, the, on this right side of the screen shows a typical appearance of a corona infected lung. It has this what's called ground glass appearance. It's a very diffuse inflammation of the lung. And this causes tremendous problems with, ventil with getting oxygen in and getting CO2 out. And this, this kind of lung infection, this lung inflammation can be deadly, especially in people with pre-existing conditions, pre-existing lung disease, heart disease, the elderly. And uh, that's why uh, prevention is key. So moving through uh, the virus, you know, when this virus first hit New York, we were overwhelmed pretty quickly. You know, I, John and I uh, talked quite a bit about you know what we could do. Uh, in fact, um, I think we were kind of at home. We were we were sort of told to go home and stay home and 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 uh, not get infected because we were afraid. Well, all the neurosurgeons that might come in, if the neurosurgeons got infected and there was no one to take care of patients, you know what would happen. So we kind of furloughed ourselves and our staff at home for the first week. But <clears throat> very in very short order, it became apparent that. We weren't going to do any neurosurgery. That the the, the cases they, they ha the the uh, hospitals were getting overwhelmed. People were staying home with multiple symptoms, and John and I both felt that we wanted to do something to help. Um, it was not going away so quickly. You know, this wasn't something that was just going to disappear. You know, there's a, a general that was asked uh, after Vietnam. He was captured during Vietnam, and he was asked you know, how come his group, his soldiers, didn't have post-traumatic stress disorder? You know, a lot of people who are captive, they, they came out of the war and they were all, they had a lot of psychiatric disease and depression. And we, you know, we were all waiting for this to end. We were just sitting at home. And what he said was that part of the reason why his team didn't have post-traumatic stress is that it's fine to be optimistic, as I am, and I know John is, and Randy is for that matter. It's great to be optimistic. But when you're always waiting for something to end and waiting for the, waiting for the future to begin or waiting to, for the bad times to go away, you kind of look for signs it's going to end. You look for the curve coming down. You, you listen for information. Oh, my, it's going to be go away by spring. It's, it's not going to be that bad. And then when it doesn't happen that way, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a setback. The key, to, uh, the key to any this chaos and this kind of stress and this kind of you know, being home during this pandemic is basically accept this as the new normal. You know, don't wait for it to end. It's going to, it'll pass, but take advantage of this opportunity just like you're doing today and, and, and getting educated. Don't wait, you know, be optimistic, but be realistic. This is the new normal right now. And so you'll be more emotionally kind of stable and likely to be able to take on these, these events in the future. You know, one of the amazing things about this that I've learned is that you always have to be prepared for high risk, low probability things. I, you know, I, I never really thought that way, that things that have low probability, you know, major natural disasters, stock market crashes, you know, entire fields being upended because of technology and technological change are the things that always prevent us from getting better. And that's why that's, that creates a lot of chaos. If you, if you really always are prepared for the fact that, you know, it's somewhere in your life, you're gonna come up against something that's very challenging you're all going to have uh, chaos someday. You're always, there is going to be change and there are going to be low probability things that happen that are tremendously risky to you in your future. So you need to be prepared for them. And this is one of them for us. We weren't really prepared for this. So what did we do? Well, when I, when I was a, a medical student, I had a, uh, a professor named John Hansen Flashen who is a critical care doctor. And he used to tell me that there are four kinds of patients in the hospital and certainly in the ICU. Patients were not sick, sick, very sick, and too sick. And the reason why it's important to break things down into that, those categories, it, it gives you a framework to think about things. It simplifies some complexity. People who are not sick in the ICU are like trauma patients that came in through the ER, say a guy drunk that was found down that gets intubated for airway protection and then by the morning he wakes up and he's fine and he's got to get the breathing tube at him and get him home. That's a not sick patient. Sometimes patients like that end up in the ICU. Sick patients are patients that are relatively healthy with a single system disease. But if you just kind of leave them alone, they get better. And, and those are the patients that often, you know, we do too much to them. 
and the best best thing sometimes is to leave well enough alone and not over treat people. Sick people tend to get better just with the basics and they get out of the hospital. The key patients in the ICU and the key patients it turns out in Corona were those that were very sick and too sick. A very sick patient, if you do the right things and you're aggressive and you have teams and you have a, you know, great communication, a very sick patient will get out of the hospital because you make good decisions, you, re you act rather than reacting and you anticipate the problems, which is the key. Patients are too sick, those who are too sick, there's nothing more you can do no matter what you do. We spend a tremendous amount of medical resource in patients that are too sick. And at the end of life, we throw all these technologies and treatments at them and that there, there's nothing that can be done. And the reason why it's important to identify the two from the very is because we wanna make sure that we don't lose very sick patients at the expense of treating too sick patients. And that was one of the challenges of coronavirus. The trouble about coronavirus is the vast majority of patients have very mild symptoms, even may, mild fever, maybe a little bit of a cough. About 80% of patients don't need hospitalization that are symptomatic. The trouble is that once you accelerate your symptoms, it can be very dangerous. You can go in what's called cytotoxic storm. That's a, the immune system overreacting to the virus and not only attacking the virus, but attacking the body itself, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, the brain, all these different organs can be affected by the cytotoxic storm. And the key at the beginning of coronavirus really is early treatment. It's trying to prevent this early inflammation that occurs in patients that get hospitalized early. One of the problems was that everybody was staying home. People with mild symptoms were staying home, but then mild became more severe and people were afraid to come to the hospital. So there were literally older people especially that waited and waited and waited and by the time they got so sick, they showed up in the ER and they needed immediate intubation and needed to go right to the ICU. And they were already beyond the point where we could intervene early. And what we learned about Corona is the best time to intervene is with steroids early. That the, the soon as people got those early symptoms of the cytotoxic storm, and I'll go into how you can pick that up, steroids seem to be very beneficial. And all steroids are, they're very cheap and they're well-known treatment. These aren't the kind of like steroids that Lance Armstrong took. These are very strong anti-inflammatories. We give these to cancer patients and people with rheumatoid arthritis and all these different inflammatory diseases, but they worked quite well to prevent patients from progressing and prevented progression to lung problems and progression from going to breathing room air to breathing more and more oxygen and needing intubation. And in fact, we really need to prevent people from getting intubated. So real briefly, let's talk about why do people get so sick in their lungs from coronavirus? Well, on the left side is a, a sort of a schematic of a lung and what these bronchioles and alveoli look like. This, the alveoli are the air exchange portions of the lung. The bronchioles are the small branches, the lung branches like tree, tree branches. And at the very end where the leaves are is like the alveoli. And each of those branches gets smaller and smaller from the trachea, which is like the trunk of, the, of the, a tree. It's like the trunk of the lung. Well, these alve alveoli are very thin permeable membranes. And what happens is, as we see in this, this picture, the blood comes in it, and then gets, gets, uh, releases the carbon dioxide and picks up oxygen on the way in. When you have an infection, there's fluid in the alveoli. So air can't get in as well. And you also have very thick and then inflamed membranes. So that really prevents that air exchange. So when we can watch that again, here, here the, the uh, blood comes in and it, it picks up the oxygen and then drops off the carbon dioxide and then leaves and goes back to the heart, oxygenated. When the lung has fluid in it, not only can't, it can't get the oxygen in, but it can't release the carbon dioxide as well. And there are two components of breathing. You release carbon dioxide and you take on oxygen. The carbon dioxide portion is called ventilation. That's the ventilation that's getting rid of carbon dioxide. Oxygenation is getting oxygen in. Carbon dioxide release is governed by tidal volume and respiratory rate, while oxygenation is governed, uh, governed by the amount of inspired oxygen, the FiO2, the amount of oxygen in the air, and the, pod, the amount of positive pressure that we can deliver to the lungs to keep those alveoli open. One of the things we can do, either with the face mask or the ventilator, 
is provide a little extra oxygen, electro pressure to the lung. If we put a little extra positive pressure into the lung, the alveoli stay in, open a little longer and allows that oxygen to come across that membrane with a little bit more, free, a little bit more time. It gives the, it gives the alveoli don't collapse and get rid of all that air. And these, there are only so much we can do to intervene. With carbon dioxide, we can change the tidal volumes. We can increase the, the, the size of the breath and we can increase the respiratory rate. That can get rid of carbon dioxide. One of the ways that we blow off CO2 is breathe more quickly, or we can take bigger, deeper breaths. The way we can increase oxygen is increase the amount of inspired oxygen we have. I don't know how many of you have ever gone to altitude, but at altitude, as we go further up in the air, like if you go to Denver, it's a mile high city, the actual inspiratory oxygen in the atmosphere is not 21% like it is at sea level. It's more like 17%. And since there's le less oxygen in the air, you actually get short of breath. You basically have to try to take deeper breaths, try to in increase the oxygenation. That actually in decreases your CO2, because when you take deeper tidal volumes and increase your respiratory rate, your carbon dioxide drops. We all think about breathing into a paper bag. Well, if you breathe into a paper bag, the more you can breathe, that's a way to increase your carbon dioxide, because you get all of a sudden you're breathing less and less oxygen. And, the, and you just can't get rid of the carbon dioxide. So you, there are examples of this in our daily lives. The problem is that when you, with, uh, with now when we talk about the physiology of the lung, with, when you have respiratory distress, you start to get inflammation of the lung. And this cytotoxic storm itself can add fluid and really pus or, or white cells that can fill the lung inter interstices, the spaces around the alveoli. And that not only prevents oxygenation, but it also can pre prevent good ventilation. One of, the, one of the things that we can do is in the blood, <clears throat> we can measure serum measures of these different proteins that can be in the blood. CRP, which is C-reactive protein, ferritin, D-dimer, and procalcitonin are four serum measures that reflect inflammation that we can pick up. So before patients really get more symptomatic, we, we will learn to follow these levels of this. It turned out that CRP, which is stands for C-reactive protein, is the best early indicator of cytotoxic storm. So the minute the CRP starts to go up, we realized that the bat, that's the best time to hit people with steroids. Ferritin didn't really, wasn't as specific to one or another. D-dimer was a reflection of clotting. That it, it turns out that patients with corona infection had a very high risk of developing blood clots. And the D-dimer assay, as that went up, was reflective of that. So if the D-dimer went above about 5,000, that was very high risk. We would actually put people on blood thinners to prevent clotting because we were, they were at very high risk of getting blood clots in their legs, their body, even have strokes. Procalcitonin is another protein. And the value of this actually was that as that went up, it was uh, 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 reflective of an active bacterial infection. The problem with corona is that if you get a in viral inflammation and in fluid, that's one thing. But the big problem is people were getting super infected with bacteria, and then they needed antibiotics, and giving steroids to people in infections could be bad. And so once you get to that secondary stage or tertiary stage of these bad inf uh, inflammation infections, people really do much more poorly. So the goal is prevent them from going from distress to failure whether it's respiratory stress or respiratory failure, it's body distress and body failure. That was the key is blocking this progression to a single, from a single respiratory issue to multi-system organ failure and really try to prevent that from happening. It also turned out that just keeping people off ventilators was beneficial, that if we could keep people on just nasal oxygen, even with extra pressure, that, even, that putting people on ventilators seemed to make the infection of corona worse. It was probably because the positive pressure maybe spread the virus throughout the lung or cause more inflammation in the lung. The, the, the goal was to get people off the ventilators quickly. The problem was that if you ended up in this kind of end stage respiratory infection, the risk of death became higher and higher. Initially, about half the patients that came into the hospital were going to the ICUs because we didn't really understand the disease very well. And the chance of dying when you were in the ICU if you're on a ventilator, it was pretty high. It was somewhere between 20 and 80%. It was much higher early. Atlantic's was more around 20 to 20 to 30%. So 
chance of death if you're on a ventilator. But if but of the patients that got the ICU, 80% of patients in the ICU needed ventilation. So the key is really preventing mechanical ventilation, attacking these people early with, with steroids and a number of other interventions. And if they did get ventilated, get them off as quickly as possible and really work to, to work their lungs. The trouble is additionally that these, these, the complications of the pulmonary problem also can infect, as I mentioned, the kidneys, the liver, the brain, the spinal tissue, and the immunological failure. And once you add additional organ systems and add their, they, and if they were sick, the chance of death goes higher and higher. I'm sure you've heard about Kawasaki's disease. Uh, if you haven't, I'll explain it to you. It's basically an inflammation in children. This was a report in, in, the, in the Asian literature originally, and it's basically a, a childhood autoimmune disease that affects kids most commonly under five. It, it can result in inflammation, which is swelling and redness of blood vessels throughout the body. It can affect the mucous membranes. It can cause lip swelling or cracked lips, swollen tongue, peeling of the skin, conjunctivitis, which is redness or swelling of the whites of the eyes and redness of the palms and soles. And you can treat this with aspirin or IV gammaglobin, which is an IV treatment. <clears throat> the trouble is, it can infect, affect the, the, the arteries of the body, especially the coronary arteries. And Kawasaki's historically can cause what are called coronary artery aneurysms, which are little blebs on the coronary arteries that can, that can cause real problems with blood supply of the heart. And this is something that's relatively new. This probably isn't the same exact disease from corona, but as a, as a group of you, if you see kids getting the, any of these symptoms, it's a sign that maybe this is a, a corona infection. Well, what the importance of this slide is to maybe make you all feel better because the vast majority of people, this is actually from almost 1600 patients that were infected early on in Italy. This is a paper in JAMA from May of this year or from April of this year. And what this showed, if you look at this first curve, is just how the majority of patients were at least 60 to 65 that were got infected. Very few patients were less than, were less than 26. I think that probably accounts for the majority of the people watching this talk, but you can still carry a symptomatic infection. And so that's why it's important that you wear a mask and you be a citizen and you aren't selfish. You know, be a leader in your community, set an example. The other graphs at the bottom are showing uh, the, this P to F ratio is a, is a, is a uh, ratio of the severity of lung disease. And, and suffice to say that these patients had very, very sick lungs. The amount of inspired oxygen they needed was on average about 60%, which is very, very high, almost toxic levels of oxygen. And the amount of positive pressure they were requiring for ventilation was also high. So they, this is a very large patients, group of patients, relatively elderly in their 60s and 70s with very sick lungs, high oxygen requirement, and needing positive pressure. And that goes till today, that the people who are the most susceptible are our parents and grandparents, and that's why we have to be careful. So I just wanted to show you what happened at Lenox Hill. Uh, this picture was from uh, early March, and we used to get these reports uh, every day about how many patients had COVID in the hospital, how many were being investigated, how many total patients were there. The house census at our hospital at Lenox on the left usually runs over 400. And in early March, like the first week of March, we basically turned off all the elective surgery. On the 20th of March, we had basically stopped all elective surgery. We only had 294 patients, which is very low. But at that time, we only had 41 corona patients and 31 that were being tested. But literally by the next day, <clears throat> we had 51 corona patients and 28 being tested with a hospital census that was still only 250. The key was getting rid of all the non-corona patients so that we could basically accept all these sick patients. This is a graph, a schematic of the beds in Lenox that were going to be used, primarily the intensive care units. 8 East, ADA was our neuro ICU. 7 East was the MICU. And we turned these into corona units. Every orange line here is a positive corona patient. You can see also in the MICU, those little diamonds are all ventilated patients. So of the 12 patients that were in the ICU, I think that's 12, some like 10 or 11 were ventilated. That's a big number. And we, this is why there was such a concern about running out of ventilators. Well, 
Watch how rapidly things change. This is on the 21st of March. By the 23rd, now we're up to 66 corona patients. We only had 40 two days ago. Patient under investigation, 46. The units were starting to fill up with not only corona patients in orange, the yellow were being tested, but look at the number of patients that were being ventilated. Look at the emergency room all the way on the right. Almost look at all the number of patients that were being tested for corona. And then by the 28th, we even stopped showing the floor beds. These are just the ICUs. And now we've got the CCU, the neurointensive care unit, and the MICU filling up with corona patients. We had to create more ICU beds to, to take on this enormous, this enormous number of sick patients. Now, now on the 28th, just eight days later from the first, that first slide, 143 coronavirus patients in the hospital, 329, we went from 250 to 329 total inpatient, uh, inpatients in the hospital. We only have 420 beds. And so it was a tremendous fear. This is this the very, very beginning of the curve. We were all fearful that we were gonna overwhelm the hospital, not only with patients, being ventilators, doctors, nurses, PPE. This is right in the center of it. Well, by April 11th, which is about the peak, this is what things looked like. And we successfully created more ICU beds. We built out, our engineers built out more ICU beds. The intensivists came out. We created new teams of people to manage all these incredibly sick patients. Now we had 303 coronavirus patients in the hospital on April 11th. And now the MICU, the CCU, the neuro ICU, the cardiothoracic units were all full of corona patients. Then 5LA, 8, these are all 5LA, 7LA, 8, these are all Lockman floors. These were never ICU beds to begin with. We had to turn them over into intensive care units, and they were all full of ventilated patients. This is overwhelming. And we reached a total sense of 408. We only have 425 beds in the whole hospital, but we managed. Our health system did a tremendous job of load shifting patients throughout the health system. As soon as one hospital got full, we started moving patients elsewhere. And this was a team approach. You know, one of the lessons I learned, one Friday, this is early on in, Mar in the, sort of towards the end of March, we, we, there was a fear we were gonna run out of ventilators. And I called my wife, who's an anesthesiologist, called, uh, called me up and says, David, you know, the, the, the plastic surgeons all have ventilators in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. There's probably a ton of these guys. So I called the chair of plastic surgery and he agreed. So we tried to procure all these ventilators to bring them to Lenox Hill. Well, that afternoon, the governor came on TV, Governor Cuomo, and he basically said he was gonna take, basically seize all the ventilators the next day. So I rushed and tried to get a truck and try to bring them all into Lenox, but the, the uh, loading dock isn't open on the weekends and I couldn't pull it off until Monday. Well, I spoke to our chief medical officer that Sunday, Dan Baker, and he told me something that will always re resonate with me. He said, you know, David, I know you, you want to do this, and I'd love to get these, these ventilators to Lenox Hill, but rest assured that if the governor takes them, a patient will get a ventilator, whether it's at Lenox Hill, Maimonides, the Javits Center, Wyckoff Hospital, Wherever a ventilator is needed, that's where it should go. And I think it, it taught me something about the importance of thinking about other people. I was just thinking about my own hospital and my own patients. And not that that's not important, but you have to think bigger than that. And you have to think of what's good for all of us. You have to think how to, how to help more than just yourself. And you know what? That's, that's very important when you have these, these crises like this. That's why the simple act of wearing a mask is so important you aren't necessarily helping yourself by wearing a mask. You're helping the, that elderly person that you walk by or the, the person that has lung disease preexistent. It doesn't really bother you to wear a mask. You know, it, the fact that there's even a question about this is a failure of leadership. It's a failure of understanding the importance of the value of someone else's life that's as important as your own. It's so painful and frustrating to listen to, it just makes me angry. And it's that, that, that mindset we have to get away from. We have to think about each other and think about rather than just think of ourselves all the time. And trust me, if we do that, we all benefit. Well, this, this slide is from the 17th of April, and now we're two months later, almost three months later, and we're down to zero corona patients. You can see how the curve peaked on or around the 11th of April, and it's been plummeting ever since. And this is because of human behavior. 
is not because of the doctors and nurses. This is because of you. This is because of people like us staying home, wearing masks, basically not interacting, not going to bars, not screaming at one another, not you know complaining, not waiting for it to end, but accepting the new normal, taking advantage of Zoom, taking advantage of streaming, taking advantage of you know conferencing and spending time with our friends and family and the people that we quarantined with. It's, it was in some ways, I think, a very important experience. The point is, there's a very small margin between slowing the virus and outbreaks. There's a thing called an R naught. R naught is basically a viral number of how many patients a single patient will infect. An R naught of less than 1.9, for example, means that the viral numbers will drop. If a, if a R naught is over 1.1, you'll get an outbreak because then one person can infect more than one person. Nine people can infect 11, let's say. And if that happens, you'll see an outbreak. So you have to prevent the spread. You have to block every person who gets infected by infecting more than one person. And that's the only way to do that right now without a vaccine or without active therapeutics is quarantine and wearing a mask and social distancing. Why? That's, that's they're very, very simple. And it's worked in New York City, and that's why we're keeping the numbers down. Well, the recovery is going to be slow. This is written by uh, someone named Scott Gottlieb, who's a really bright guy. The AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, is a right of center think tank that I, I, I ascribe to. I'm a little left of center personally, but I really enjoy reading you know, other people's uh, ideas and, and concepts. And, Scott was really the one who wrote up this kind of four phase of recovery. And we were sort of in phase two to three right now. We originally slowed the spread, increased critical care beds. We kind of treated this big wave of patients. And then we isolated. We started in phase two, we started open schools and business. Although we really never got to school reopening. We decreased, make, maintained smaller social gatherings. We, we've accelerated therapeutics, primarily steroids and some other like remdesivir and something, some antiviral therapies have shown to be beneficial. The, but the vaccine's still probably, you know, at least six months away. And until we get a vaccine and more robust therapeutics, tracing, isolation, physical distancing, and quarantine are still going to be important. We're just not going to get to the point where we can just reopen society and go to concerts and baseball games. It's not going to happen. And we're just going to have to just accept this and not hope it ends but take it as it is and live there. Phase four is after we get a vaccine. And hopefully we'll all have learned something that we'll all think more globally, think more unselfishly about the importance of supply chains and, and centralization and partnership. That's gonna be the key to this happens again. And I think ultimately as we emerge from this, we're gonna come back better. I think neurosurgery, our department will come back better. We've made a big push, this entire conference is an expression of that. We never would have done a conference with 800 people paying attention before coronavirus. It never could have happened, but now we can. So we can have better communication, better education. We can use these, these things to have better healthcare, smarter telehealth, sm more cohesion, spear in the community. That's what we're gonna do coming out of this. And you know, ultimately it's gonna come down to a vaccine though. And this is a great story. You know, when I was a medical student, and I want to, you know, move to, towards the end of this talk now to stimulate you. I, I worked in a lab at UPenn with a woman named Catalina Carrico, who's the, 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 she was the first author on this paper that I wrote with her. And this came out in, in 2001. That's a while ago. I'm sure many of you weren't even born then. But the fact is, is that we were looking at mRNA back then. We were looking at using mRNA as like a drug. And it turns out I left Penn and went to my resident, I went through my residency and left New York, came to New York City. Well, Kate kept at this. And what she, it turns out that she became her idea, her, her discovery after, far after I left, had to do with what the basis is for the current vaccine technology is. Kate's science, and I know Kate very well, she's one of the smartest people I know, is the basis for two of the vaccines that are out there. And what she showed was that she found a reason how the, these mRNAs can be stabilized 
and can be used as a vaccine. And now the Moderna vaccine, which will likely be the first mRNA vaccine ever, where they basically use the mRNA that targets that S protein I talked about at the very beginning. What it does is it, it basically causes a translation of just the S protein, and that generates a, a, an immune response to the protein. That immune response then attaches the protein and theoretically will prevent that very first binding step that I showed you in that first slide, prevents that protein from binding that ACE receptor. That's amazing. To have to have to think way back when this started, you know, 30 years ago, and have this be valuable right now. What you're doing today, you're beginning to get information, you're meeting people, you're developing the relationships and the information sources that hopefully one of you will make a discovery or make a contribution just like Kate's making, and you'll be sitting and talking about this someday. And hopefully this is the start of that, this process that you're going through right now. And I congratulate you for doing this in the summer. You do a lot of other things on July 4th weekend. Well, you know, just to end this talk, I went to the Javits Center after I worked in the ICUs in that picture earlier, when I was learning about how to take care of corona patients with this great team of pulmonologists and, and medical doctors. I went to the Javits Center to work with the military in the ICUs and I met this guy. This guy's name is Zach Iskall. Zach was a Marine and he fought in Fallujah as a Marine. And he was helping the governor manage Javits Center and help, there's a lot of bureaucracy and, and a lot of things to set up. And he told me that all the, in all the military things he'd been involved in as a Marine, that this was probably the greatest, most impactful thing he'd done in his career. And he said, the reason why is that in, in the military, when you're fighting a war, you're kind of kill your enemy. And it's not that gratifying, it's stressful. No one's, we're not born to kill other human beings. The point is with corona, with this corona uh, pandemic, now he was involved in saving lives and, and, and building a structure to help save lives. The enemy was the virus, but the goal was to save people. And this was to him, the most important aspect of his life. For me, it was too. And it wasn't so much that I, felt like I, I had been saving lives before as a neurosurgeon, but going through this experience and using my training in a totally different area was incredibly gratifying. You know, this is a great op-ed piece, piece to read if you write this down from David Brooks on April 15th of 2020. I love David Brooks too. And I, the reason why this is important is this, the, 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 the op-ed piece talked about great inflation and coddling of our youth and that basically making everybody feel good and telling them they're special and not, not basically forcing you to be better and calling you out when, you're, when, you, when you can be better and, and pushing you to be, be, you know, pushing you harder. But the point is that science is not subjective. It's very objective. You know, there's not a lot of great inflation on a physics test or an organic chemistry test. It is what it is. It's like golf. You can't, you can't really, it's hard to cheat in golf, especially at the pro level. You know, whatever your score is at the end, that's your score. And the truth is, is that in science, it's the beauty of science. If you work hard and you train hard, it, it's, the result is clear. And the point is that what makes medical school and the hardship of medical school so valuable. And he writes as a component of that, that excellence is not an action, it's a habit. In order to be excellent, you have to make it a habit. Tenacity is not a spontaneous flowering of good character. Character, you have to become tenacious. What tenacity is, it's doing what you were trained to do. It manifests not in those whose training spared them hardship, but in those whose training embraced hardship and taught students to deal with it. Work hard, hardship's a good thing. Train, learn from the hardship. Failure is very, very important because failure and learning from those errors is what real learning is. And the harder you work and the harder you train, the more likely you are to be successful. On the right-hand side is a woman with that, that little bandaid on her neck is from her central line in her neck. And this is what Javits Center looked like. I remember changing, I was in the military, but I had to go in and change every day in this area where, the, where these guys were. And I looked at these jackets and I would be lying to you if I'd said I didn't really want to take one home. But it made me realize the, the importance of what we were doing. And I, I felt proud to be an American again. 
and I, no matter what your nationality, when you're working to save lives, whether it's an American life or an Italian life or a Brazilian life or whatever, it doesn't make a difference. But I felt empowered. We were working in the, this is the Javits Center in the center, what it looked like. It was, it was basically a convention center that got turned into a hospital. And in my life, I've done a lot of great surgeries and I've saved lives. But this woman here was the first, the first patient that I took care of from, from when she came in, when she got intubated, using the, 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 uh, the learn, the, learned the hardship that I went through at Lenox and learned how to take care of these patients. And I worked hard to extubate her, to get the breathing tube out. And she went home. And it was clearly one of the, my most gratifying experiences of my whole medical career. And I'm a neurosurgeon. I'm not a critical care pulmonary doctor. And that, that's the point. That it doesn't, whether you're operating on somebody's brain or taking care of somebody's lungs, the gratification is the same. And in fact, in some ways, this is even more gratifying because it was so unexpected. So don't give up. And we've used in our department these ideas that our, this butterfly, this whole idea about the butterfly project really grew out of making ourselves better coming out of the pandemic, using all the lessons learned to improve our department and use all these different technologies to really help us get better. As an example, mo mobile devices can be used to FaceTime or to make movies. We can communicate with people what's called synchronously like this. We're doing synchronous communication now. Or we can record this video and you can go watch it on YouTube later. That's asynchronous communication. There's all sorts of ways to use technology to educate and to communicate in healthcare. And we're planning on continuing to use these things, whether it's Zoom or mobility or telehealth in our, in our practice going forward. We created these different silos in our department and used technology as the enabler across the different technologies, whether it's in our clinics, our patients, our research, our inpatients, education and administrative functionality. And you'll hear about a lot of this stuff over the course of the next eight weeks. Each of these areas are unique to each department and we have to identify how to be better in each one. So every day we used to come out of the hospital during Corona. This is the corner of 77th and Lexington. And if you ever want to come visit, just walk by. This is a Starbucks. You can see they were they opened for delivery only. But this is what it was like outside the hospital at seven o'clock every day. So it's tremendously gratifying, but most importantly, the people to celebrate were the nurses, the respiratory technicians, the people that were going to these patients' rooms who don't always get the attention. Healthcare is a remarkable thing. I think coronavirus, the pandemic, revealed that to all of us. The teams that we that bound together, our, our new camaraderie, and coming out and seeing our nurses and the, and the attention that they get and they deserve was truly extraordinary. We actually used Zoom to talk to Wuhan. This is a group of Chinese doctors early on. We had contacts in China that set this up. We talked to, to the Chinese doctors in Wuhan to get some ideas from them about how they took care of patients. This was an extraordinary time, reaching across political differences and across boundaries because ultimately healthcare, there is no politics in healthcare. There's no Republicans and Democrats or Chinese and Americans. We're all human. And in the end, I know I showed this at the beginning, but it's, these are important words. And I won't read it again. We are at our best, are our best when we serve others. And I congratulate all of you for taking this course. Hopefully you'll be inspired, hopefully be educated, and hopefully you unite us and we'd be better for it. So that's it. I'm done. I don't know if there are any questions. I don't see the chat. I'll stop sharing my screen. There you go. Yeah, a lot of thank yous coming in right now. And then
how many days of I can see. Uh, from Uruguay. Yeah, I mean, uh, Latin America, we all got behind a little bit. I think that, um, you know, I can't, um, the American experience didn't, it wasn't exactly uh, indexed for the way to handle this. And I think, unfortunately, uh, our government uh, failed us in a big way. And it's not Republican or Democrat. This is just back a lack of leadership. I mean, this is the, this is the ideal moment for a leader to be be strong and, 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 and be consistent. And no matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, and whether whatever your politics is, this is an opportunity to lead. And this is an abandonment of leadership. If you look around the world, there are there was politics in every other European country. Germany, there were politics, there were politics in Italy. Yet the, the leadership shined, France. And if you look at, and in fact, this is an opportunity to, to bind people together. This election would have been completely different had our president just done the right thing. You know, all he had to do was put some of this stuff aside and he would have won the election in spades. And now, you know, I'm not so sure. But leadership is everything, especially in times of chaos. It's when leadership is demanded. It's when, it's when you're given rare opportunities in your life, when everything is perfect and everything's going well, it's easy to be a leader. You know, that's not the hard part. You know, you can show up and tell people what to do and Everything's easy, but when things start to deteriorate and when the, and the future isn't clear, when all the normal things are at risk and at, at stake, you know, that's when a leader has to stand up and emerge. And all leadership really is, is creating an idea and getting other people to believe in an idea. And anybody can be a leader. All of you can be leaders. It's, we, we can all do that. It's a matter, it, it's all different levels. But this, this to me, was for my personally one of the greatest experiences of my life but for on the on the big picture it's just breathtakingly done so breathtakingly poorly in our country of all places and i just i do believe that we will learn from this and this will be a, almost a shock to our system and like i said this will pass and it's up to you guys to do better in the future Uh, the second wave, you know, it's not really a second wave. Um, there's a guy named Michael Osterholm, who's a, an epidemiologist at the University of Minnesota. It's more like a forest fire right now. It's, it's just simmering underneath. There's a big burn, and then it kind of, the forest fire got kind of put out. But it's, but it's going to be, as long as there's wood to burn, this will burn. And the only way to extingu extinguish is a vaccine. So you, you just don't, you just can't look at it as waves anymore. Certainly in the United States, it's just a continuous burn. And until we get used to that, and until we just all basically buy into that concept to stop worrying about yourself so much and start thinking about the person next to you for the first time in many people's lives, that's when we have an opportunity to impact this and hopefully slow the burn. But there's, there's, there's no other way to do it, unfortunately. And if there's, if there's any question about that, just look at our curbs versus every other Western country in Europe and everywhere else in the world that has the capability of doing this. It's just so incredible that our country, United States in, in 2020 could have done this to ourselves. And I, and I, I just uh, can't emphasize that enough. Selfishness and lack of leadership is what this is about. So learn from this. You know, this is a great experience for all of you and, and to spread the, spread the message going forward. Josh, is there another talk now at, at 11? Nope. That's You're it? the last one for today. All right, so uh, it's hard to answer all these questions. I'll try to you know, I'll spend another few minutes if I see any. How do you feel we should help third world countries? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's hard for um, us in the United States to help anybody. Certainly don't use us as an example. I think that the third world, if you look at some countries in Africa, they have two ventilators in the entire country. It's a huge problem. You know, I think that the key is that steroids are cheap. 
and I think the best thing to do is get people on steroids early. Uh, Decadron is the drug or methylprednisolone. Uh, they can be detrimental. They can cause hyperglycemia. They can exacerbate diabetes, but it's just a short course to pulse the steroids during cytotoxic storm. And since they're relatively cheap, it's, it's the, the easiest, best, and you know, maybe a little dirty. In other words, it's not, the easy, it's not curative, but it's gonna prevent some people from really going too far. And that's, I think, the most one of the most important thing about them. Um, and I think that may, that may help in the third world because we can get steroids to third world countries, but it's gonna be tough to get ventilators there. And I think that that's gonna be really tough. Plus you need doctors and nurses and respiratory technicians to manage them. You know, that, that's really tough to see. And I, I think that uh, ultimately the, the population density is gonna, in, in some of these countries could really be a problem, particularly in India and uh, some of these, the, some other countries where it could be a real problem where the medical condition could be worse. Um, let me see where all other questions working backwards. Flatten the curve in that Latin America, social distancing and masks. That's it. And, um, you know, obviously if you have a fever, stay away from people. If you know you're sick, quarantine, 14 days. Yes, there are long-term effects after COVID. It's one of the biggest problems. Even young people can have scarring of their lungs. And even when the body recovers, you can, have, you can last for months, if not longer. The lungs get scarred and very damaged. And so if you do get bad lung inflammation, it can be not only deadly, but it can even if you survive, there could be long-term effects. I have a friend of mine who's an, a surgeon who still three months later is still very tired and just run down. He just hasn't been able to get his energy back. This is a, a multi-system disease. And it's not as deadly as we would think. It's not, and it's, but it's not the, it's the fear of death that does kill, there's no question. But especially in the youth, it's rare for a young person to die. It does happen. But I think that ultimately it's prevention in the youth. You have to be preventative to, to get, prevent the, the, the infection extending to, the, to pe your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents. The, as far as college and universities, I think we're gonna have a hard time. You know, I think colleges are gonna open up, but I don't have to tell you, it's gonna be hard not to have frat parties and you know, young kids are social. And I do think it's gonna be impossible to prevent infection. And I'd be surprised if we make it to the first semester intact. I, you know, I think we'll probably see infections flares up and then the colleges will have to quarantine or close early. I know some are opening early to try to open in the summer, do more outdoor stuff. But you know, I, I think that we're, already, we're seeing a, a big increase, especially in Texas, Florida. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna be around by September or August. It's not gonna go away. And I, I think you're gonna, we're gonna have to be very careful. It, the key is if we do open colleges is make sure that if we do see flares that we shut the things down or else the, all these kids are gonna bring these infections home and it's gonna be like a super spreader event. So that's a real problem. And I think we have to really rethink this potentially if it does happen. Um, what do you suggest to, to say to people who try to make it a political, you know, use social media guys. Use social media. You know, I never realized the impact of this, honestly, until the Netflix show. You know, I, I, I didn't really use it very often. And I think ultimately it's the best way. Get out there, take pictures of people with masks. Don't make it negative. You know, don't, don't feed into the negativity. There's no reason to. You know, no one wants to hear negative stuff. Promote it. Talk about the beauty of it. Lone Ranger, whatever. You know, it's, it's, there's lots of ways to be positive here. And don't, don't point fingers just use yourself and demonstrate leadership. So all you can do is do the right thing and, and let everybody else watch you. That's the way to react to this. Um, how important do you think the use of nanotechnology, you know, back to you? I mean, I think that, um, then, not, not don't think nanotechnology should have a big impact on coronavirus. I think we're gonna have vaccines in short order. I think we should have vaccines, hopefully by early to mid next year, if, if these early trials uh, work. The typical course of steroids is about a week, hopefully. If they break the steroids, I mean, they're probably not gonna work and they may be less effective. There's Atlantics, we had a second course of steroids later on. Um, but again, a lot of this is experimental. It's the first time we ever saw this virus. Um, was there much of that in Lennox? 
uh, I don't think quite get this question. We did a lot of work to code into our computer structures and ways and means for Corona KD picked up for reporting for resume. Um, we had these dashboards that these, you know, keep a track of, of what was what, yes. Okay, guys, it's about 11 o'clock. I, I hope, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to um, all of your um, questions, um, but um, many of these probably can, uh, yeah, I'm wearing a Go Blue shirt. It's my daughter went to Michigan. I didn't go, but uh, Go Blue. Um, anyway, thank you for uh, everything, guys, and terrific experience. I'll be doing these lectures every Friday. I have a couple of other ones planned, and some are unplanned. I uh, can't tell you much. I appreciate this, and have a great weekend.